Negro demonstrations in the North have made it clear that the revolution is national in scope. Everybody here keeps going. Every one of them must know, deep down, there's very little chance that what they want will be given anytime soon. That I know that justice is indivisible. I grew up in a place called Meridian, Mississippi, that uh, ended up being, for the most part, the epic center of the civil rights movement. Even as early as six years old, I noticed that the water fountains, one for colored, written colored, and there was one for white. The one for colored was like a little small basin. The water was not freely flowing from that particular one. And I looked in the inside and it would look rusted. But just immediately next to it was this rectangular shaped machine that made this roaring, mon monotonous sound. And I noticed that the water was flowing freely. I drank from the, the, the one that said colored, but the water was warm. It wasn't cool and refreshing. And I saw this tank with this water and some of it dripped on me while I was at the lower one and it was cool. So I turned and I drank from it. In my mind, I said, who would do this? And my mother in her own way would try to explain to me, well, you know, there are rules that we are living under, Jim Crow law. I don't particularly like it either, but these are the things that we're supposed to do. And I was thinking, but why? So of course, every chance I got, I was told not to drink from it. I always did. What comes to mind when thinking about the Civil Rights Movement? Most people think of Jim Crow signs in the South and the violent, outright racism that permeated those states. But all over the country, including the town of North Hempstead and surrounding areas, communities had their own racial tension. Racism was simply expressed a little differently here. In the United States, what we have are two different types of racial segregation. De jure segregation means segregation by law. That's where it says that separate and unequal schools will exist. Uh, black kids go to these schools, white kids go to these schools. De facto segregation, there are no laws that segregate people, but people live in different communities. It was covert as well as overt racism that was existing, and it was hard to really pinpoint but we knew it existed. This is Long Island, a place where things have happened, are happening, are going to happen. A lot of people in Long Island wanted to end legal segregation. There was a group that uh, were activists and there was a group that just accepted things the way they were. We became known as activists. We were proud of it. What we did was not because there was a movement or a law or anything like that. We just knew it wasn't the right thing at the time. We went with groups and we did it spiritually. It wasn't violent. Because we felt we, what we were doing was right and honorable as citizens. Don't get involved in that. If you do that, you, you might get killed. I've had people who say you want too much and the rot through us, but then I have those who have been there all along, they wasn't just for the show or when the cameras came. And that's what has propelled me to be in this movement almost for decades. The idea of so many people representing so many different coalitions working together for the same purpose, that's a good feeling. By 1965, the Supreme Court decisions with the Civil Rights Act, with the Voting Rights Act, is that legal segregation has been defeated. So one of the things that happens is a lot of white support for the Civil Rights Movement ends. And people are saying, well, there's no segregation by law here. Why do we have to have these people in our school? Why do we have to have these people in our neighborhood? We'll let them live in with their own. And we see that in, in Long Island as well. They tend to become less supportive when the issues become local. In order to understand how any Negro feels under segregation, you have to realize that 
from the time of infancy, he has it pounded into him that he's not as good as other people. There are things he cannot do. Don't do this, you can't do this, you can't do the other. It um, builds into a man a feeling of inferiority, a feeling of frustration, a feeling of resentment. From 1945 to 1960, there is increasing racial segregation. World War II changed the face of Long Island. It had brought over 100,000 defense workers to the area, and the end of the fighting overseas released millions of GIs to fight at home for some place to live. On Long Island, an imaginative building concern, Levitt and Sons, had an idea about this problem. A new kind of Long Island home was designed, a quality house, but one that could be rented for $60 a month. But Levittown actually has a covenant in its original sales and leases that said they will not be sold and they will not be resold to African Americans. As a result, Levittown becomes all white. And we understood that it was going to be all white. We were very happy to buy a home here. Do you think a Negro family moving here will affect the community as a whole? Definitely. So what you get on, on Nassau County is the channeling of blacks into less desirable areas and basically white veterans be able to purchase where they want. The banks maintain a system of redlining. They have neighborhoods on the maps circled in red. Those are the neighborhoods where you can go to. The other neighborhoods you cannot. Realtors decided that some of the houses became lower income and they were able to get people to sell their houses. Parents got nervous. Neighborhoods were changing, buildings were deteriorating, schools were changing. And they then began to put blacks in an area and when the area quote unquote tips, the whites leave. I don't have any prejudice uh, against uh, colored. It's just that I wouldn't like to have one as a neighbor. I remember when Westbury was not a mixed community at all. Certain sections here in Westbury is nothing but black because the whites moved out. This was called white flight, the move of white city dwellers to the suburbs to escape the influx of minorities. The whites who are leaving urban areas, they don't want what they see as the problems of their old communities coming with them. And they become very intently involved in limiting who can move into them. When I first came here, it was very difficult for a black family to move into other parts of Great Neck. Very, very difficult, even if they could afford it. People who sell to blacks or rent to blacks or black friends receive intense pressure not to do it. We realize early, we have two boys and they can't live in Great Neck. They have tried to get places and they've been turned down. So civil rights workers began to press the banks to provide African Americans with mortgages so they could buy houses where they wanted to. And that's the covert racism that exists, institutionalized racism. It was subtle, but it was real. It was in Manhasset and in Great Neck. If a Negro family can afford what you can afford, how do you justify your feeling of superiority? You also had areas being rebuilt, cleaned up, and African Americans being kicked out. Most northern cities now are engaged in something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. It means Negro removal. That is what it means. And that was a, a phrase that people knew. The government used urban renewal funds to redevelop certain areas they called ghettos or slums. These areas often happen to have a larger African-American population. After redevelopment, the properties were too expensive for the original families to live there anymore. They came up with suitcases of money and said, look, I'll buy your property. And basically drive out the African-American population. We are in a community that used to be African-American, but I can show you a community in Spinney Hill. It used to be 100% African-American. 50 years ago. Now we would be maybe 10%. Families were being displaced. And they called it progress. Workers were living in intolerable situations. They were just shanty shacks. 
Each house close to each other looked like if there were a fire, the whole thing would go down. Which I didn't see in Montgomery. In Alabama, our home was just as beautiful as some of the homes in Rosalind Garden. And it was just a very sad thing in my community that we should have such a thing going on. I was an active member of the Committee on Human Rights, and so housing was an important issue. When they started looking at the housing condition in the town of North Hempstead, they wanted change. Typically with urban renewal, people who are relocated, quote unquote, are given a bus ticket. In those days, it was a bus ticket back down south. Some of the families chose to relocate from Roslyn to Westbury. And we also got 12, a dozen private homes built. And people who had been dislocated got those homes. I applied to live in Roslyn Garden, sent my security in, carried it to the office, and two days later they sent it back to me and said that the apartment had been rented. And she called me and she said, I just left Edward Street and they said they don't have any apartments. I said, fine, stay where you are. Lila and I will go look for an apartment right away. Marjorie Gatz and Lila Schachter went as two white women and said they wanted to rent an apartment. They showed them the same apartment. And of course, we were offered three different apartments. We went, we picked up Hazel. I filed a suit with the New York State Human Rights Commission and they did the investigation. They looked at the complex to see how many blacks was there, none. Wanted to know how many vacant apartments they had, they had several. All of us went back to the Edward Street Apartments and confronted the rental agent and Hazel got her apartment. I was the only black there, I was proud and uh, I was on the front page a Long Island Press that I integrated Roslyn. And from that, those blacks became active. There were many of us from North Hempstead who participated in, in that kind of battle. In addition to the struggle to desegregate housing, schools in the town of North Hempstead needed change. Grade schools were still heavily segregated and civil rights activists had to fight for integration here as well. The leadership began to argue that we should not just be involved in civil rights in the South, we have to be involved in civil rights in Great Neck itself. And the leadership of the civil rights campaign in Great Neck proposed a plan that African-American students in New York City could be able to attend Great Neck schools to integrate Great Neck so that the children of Great Neck can have an interracial experience. And that leads to rebellion. Probably the most significant and difficult issue that came up is the integration of the schools, the busing. I was particularly interested in it because I had been working in Boston for three years and it was being debated uh, by the school board who were very much opposed to it. And I remember sitting next to an African-American kid and one of the spokesmen ag against the busing who was a, a member of the school board said, how can you possibly take a black child and put him next to a white child and uh, this kid sitting next to me yelled out, get two chairs. I brought that feeling down here. So when I heard this rumbling about busing, I got involved in it too, and I was disappointed that it didn't pass. I, I was hoping that more people would be uh, won over to it. And it was probably very naive, and maybe it was too early. A century ago, slavery was abolished but a pattern of segregation took its place. Although there have been significant changes, we are still deprived in many instances of full rights and opportunities. Manhasset is mostly Irish or uh, Catholic. So those kids had 
not only the public school, the Manhattan Public School, but they had the parochial schools where because of their religion and their culture, they went. So the black kids stayed in the valley. We all went to a segregated school, the Manhattan Valley School. After about 20, 25 years, a major step toward integrating us was when Supreme Court decided that this was a segregated school and so they closed it. We were forced to go to Plandome Road School. I think I was about 17. We marched from outside of this church and we walked all the way to Manhasset Plandome Road and we became integrated at that school. It was a memorable event that took place which signified that we'd have to go to school here segregated. Now we would be integrated into the uh, Manhattan school system. I was excited, I, 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 we, we, we were happy. I thought it was fantastic to see the people of this community come together. This new venture was gonna really do something for this community, something bigger than what we'd ever expect. In Roslyn, the kids were being uh, put out out of those public schools to go to BOCES because of behavior problems. Very often, African-American children were sent to BOCES, a special education school. I can remember a number of them who were so-called obstreperous or spoke a little differently, class disturbances, that kind of thing. BOCES does a wonderful job, always has. But if you have a kid who has a problem that can be resolved, in the classroom that he or she would be in, that's the right way to do it. They found that some children behavior would cause they needed glasses, but the school was not ready to deal because they were used to the middle class and the rich children who was able to live in Roslyn. And once the Roslyn Committee for Civil Rights became aware, we picketed. Well, we had a protest in order to get those kids out of BOCES back to Roslyn. We sat down with the board and didn't get any place. We had to replace the board. And then the board members we got began the changes. In Westbury, there was a tremendous push by African American students demanding that their school's curriculums include courses in black history. These black children needed to see their culture and understand who they was and not be treated differently. Become proud of their heritage because you can't really engage yourself unless you know who you are. We then began to put pressure on the school districts that they didn't have any African Americans, blacks teaching while the black, the population of black kids in the school system was increasing. Districts are not hiring African-American teachers. There are more and more African-Americans who are qualified to become teachers and were able to get teaching certification. And now they're moving out to Nassau. They won't be able to teach out here. We went to the school boards and began to talk about uh, why didn't they uh, hire black teachers? They said they couldn't find any. Oh, we said, oh, we got black colleges all across the South. Connecticut, they have black teachers. Why not here in the town of North Hempstead? And so we fought uh, and went to school board meetings and yelled and screamed, speaking out with parents about it, and so we did. I think the major uh, success in bringing in more minority teachers really rested in the fact that minority parents made that demand. It took a little agitation. It took going to a town hall, booing. We demonstrated. It was a big deal. It took a number of years. It didn't just happen. We began to hire teachers in Roslyn and in Port Washington and in Great Neck, African-American teachers coming into those uh, white school uh, districts that we had. Despite the overt and subliminal racism, there was also some very positive change happening in the North Hempstead area. 
over the years, even though I, I realized that there was some things happening, it did not define me who I, who I am. There was a lot of support that we receive in the South from the white community, from some of the churches, from the Jewish community. In the 1960s, Great Neck has at the time a, a large Jewish population and a very active synagogue. And the Great Neck Synagogue is very much pro-civil rights. Great Neck uh, was always a rather extraordinary community. The town of North Hempstead was in the forefront for equality. It becomes a major fundraising source. Because of the background, frankly, of my people, the Jewish people, this was so important. We develop a tremendous respect and love for each other's cultures, each other's religion. They understood that there had to be a connection and not a division. I think part of the compassion that Jews have for the downtrodden in general is a result of the centuries of suffering that we have been taught about. So there was an identification with them. And after World War II, this is a population that remembers the European Holocaust. They know what happened in uh, Nazi Germany when they passed racial laws. It's just the nature, I think, for the most part, of Jews who really understand their faith to realize that it's our battle too. It's the thing you do uh, to support somebody who's downtrodden and certainly worse off than you are. What they had seen on TV or what they had read or what they had been told about who black people was, they didn't buy that. They saw blacks as human beings something to offer and could make contributions. They treated me like a brother, genuine, authentic brotherhood. And that's why it was very easy for me to start a black Jewish dialogue as pastor for 35, 40 years. Corley and I each gave talks about the importance of having more brotherhood in the community. And it occurred to us in our temple to have a Martin Luther King Sabbath, Friday evening. We called it the Martin Luther King Shabbat. After the service, we asked for comments. I remember one said, we're talking about understanding and brotherhood, and then we're gonna go home and we're not gonna see each other again. Maybe next year. Why don't you do something? So, Corley and I sat down after that and decided, okay, we got to have our congregations come together. And so we created a black Jewish dialogue. Whenever there was any kind of a situation that we felt that we had to address, we would talk. What can the synagogue Temple Bethel do and what can our church, Mount Olive Baptist Church, do together to address some of those systemic problems within the black community? You have to find people who are like-minded to help you get your policies through, resolutions, uh, speak to school boards. There are people just like you who care for the same things you care for. They feel passionate to the extent that they're willing to lay down their lives. One of the things that came out of that relationship with the Temple Bethel is the medical program. They had about 50 or 60 doctors who are members of the synagogue who would treat some of the ailments of our members of our church and in the community for free. That was one way to address a health need. Temple Bethel rose up to the, to the situation, whatever we can do. We did some actual practical things, but we did it quietly. We were not able to resolve all the problems, but at least we put a dent in some of the things. It took black and white to accomplish what we did. It wasn't just black people. I mean, the black community was too small to accomplish anything. You don't vote. You can't make a difference. You can't get me elected. But it was the people around them who could get them elected that they had to listen to. Some of us that were working in the movement knew we were supported. And I think that gave us the, also the encouragement 
to continue it to go on. Martin Luther King Jr. made many appearances on Long Island during the Civil Rights Movement. He spoke at Temple Bethel. We were scheduled to go there. It was terrific at my temple. Thousands of people, they couldn't even get in the temple, I was there to see Dr. King. He came as part of a panel of black leaders to discuss the civil rights movement and what was going on and why they should be a part of it. And he gave a speech about how we had to come together. And what we ought to do as a member of the clergy and members of, uh, of the body of faith, the kinds of things that we, we could not tolerate, we could not remain silent on. And what the Jewish community had meant to the civil rights movement, coming to the South, raising money. There was this bond, this understanding that the pathway to justice had to be a partnership. Martin had a great appreciation for his Jewish brothers and sisters. It was a very, very moving and very important moment. It's historic, but little known, that this speech was the first public utterance by King in opposition to the war in Vietnam. But then, in a few weeks, he went to the Riverside Church. It is characterized as one of his most important, if not most important, speech, because there he very clearly attacked the war in Vietnam. Others can do what they want to do. That's their business. Other civil rights leaders, for various reasons, refuse or can't take a stand or have to go along with the administration. That's their business. But I must say tonight that I know that justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. I met Martin Luther King a number of times here in North Hempstead. The first time I met him, he had been in Hempstead and a couple of other places that day, and he was going to speak at the Great Neck South High School. And they were taking a break and having a quick supper. He was so tired that he crumpled back into his seat, and he was very generous and kind with us, but he was exhausted. And the next time I saw him, I was in Great Neck South High School waiting for him to come. And I watched him come on the stage just filled with energy. Everybody stood up cheering. And there he was with his booming voice. And I knew it was coming from somebody who had been absolutely just numb with fatigue. He was giving to that audience such strength. You gotta have the guts to be able to stand up for what's right no matter what the consequences are. When Martin spoke at the Washington Monument, most of the Jewish community went down. It was so many people that came from all over. There was busloads and busloads. To be in the midst of all of that, it was a good feeling. Everybody was praying for the same thing. All his life was about peace, talking about how we can change. We were moving towards a more just society, a more just America where people could be accepted. That was Dr. King's dream, that we could live together, that our children could go to school and achieve and use their talent and had an opportunity to do so. Ethics is not focused in the South or the North or the West or the East. Understanding, compassion are values that are universal. And it's unfortunate that we have uh, such divisiveness in the country today. <sighs> New York State schools are amongst the most racially segregated in the United States. The children of North Hempstead are going to be going into colleges where the student populations are diverse, they're going to be going into the workforce where populations are diverse. What we are doing by maintaining racially separate schools is we're denying all of our children the experience they need to work with people who are different from them. 
and I think that's the that's part of the problem. I think there's so much division because people don't really know who people are. They don't get to know them. They have this. Someone make this demarcation line and said, "Never the two shall meet," and you don't you you're you're robbing yourself of a very important education. I think people should just get to know people a little bit more and understand, open up those lines of communication. To begin to understand our racism, we have to really uh, start when we're very young. We have to live together, we have to work together, we have to grow up together and be educated together. You have to be taught to hate. As long as your parents didn't teach you to hate, you're not going to teach your children to hate. And you know that people who do hate are in the wrong. You know you can teach people to hate, but you can also teach people to love. My congregation, I want people to love. And of course, little children identify kids of a different race by something else. The, the, you know, the girl with the red dress. They don't even see it. I was not reared in a home that talked about hatred. Even in Montgomery, I had a chance to be with whites because my grandmother worked for a white family. When I went with her, when she washed and ironed their clothes, they would treat me just like they would treat any other normal child. I could have milk and cookies and sit down, but that's not the experience that everybody had. I said, you have to do unto others you would have them do to you. We're children of God. God intends for us to not only do good, but to be good. The young people don't know the history, and they think that everything is still fine because in most of colleges, they do see African Americans. They do see uh, people from different parts of the country. They do need to study the Civil Rights Movement to understand the battles that it faced, the accomplishments that were made and then they have to understand what the situation is now. The Voting Rights Act, which was so extremely important to have an opportunity to vote, is being rolled back. To see where we are now frightens me because the civil rights movement worked hard and long. People died because people should have a right to participate. No one should be denied a right to vote. It's a movement that needs to be revived. And the only thing that has made a difference is people working together. No one can do it alone. No one. You need voices to come together. I never would accomplish anything without people of goodwill and people who wanted to see everyone be included. Anything you want in life, you gotta, you gotta work for it, and you have to believe. And create enough of a fuss, you know, fearlessly and regularly. You know, you get knocked down in this business, and you see something that you think is good uh, just snatched from under you. Sometimes people ask, do you think racial discrimination is as bad today as it was uh, in the 1950s. I think bad or worse is the, the wrong way to look at it. I think it's different. Racism still exists in the United States, so the issue is not is it better or worse, but how is it similar, how is it different, and how can we utilize the law to expand social justice and equality in the United States? According to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, an independent bipartisan agency established by Congress in 1957, at least 23 states have enacted newly restrictive statewide voter laws since the Shelby County decision in 2013. I think that because many of us are older now, younger people have to take on the banter. Get yourself involved. Even if somebody slammed the door in your face, you open the door and go out, they see you coming out there, slam the door. So what? Let them slam the door. I believe that each generation has a responsibility to fight for social changes. And if we can somehow teach our young people 
Don't waste your freedom. Don't waste your gifts. Use what you have to make a difference in the world. You don't want to leave here without making a difference, letting somebody else know how, how significant you are and how significant they are. Regardless of race. Part of this project was also to collect oral histories from people who lived through the civil rights movement. We are taking all of these stories and preserving them for generations to come.